Good morning. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Good morning. Good morning. Much better. Right now we're next door to an eminent scholar, Jeffrey Snover. I want him to know how sad he is for not being in this talk. <laughs> So my name is David Blank Edelman. I am the technical evangelist at a company called AppSera. Um, I should, since they're helping me be here, just mention they're people that make software that allow you to take uh, whatever job, whatever workload you want, run it in like on-prem or in the cloud, move it around. There's a cool policy engine in the middle. If you're interested in it, come talk to me later. Um, but if you want to sort of like tell me what you think of this talk, feel free to tweet at me at, at Otterbook. Um, or if you would like to tell my employer what you think of this talk, and they kind of like it if people say nice things, but you can say whatever you want, um, feel free to tweet at them. And uh, I'm a little worried about that. So um, I want to know how many of the people in this room remember the Choose Your Own Adventure books in this room. So a vast majority of you, the rest of you, I'm assuming your parents didn't allow you to read or something growing up. Um, so you remember stuff like this, right? Right, or uh, Journey Under the Sea. I'm just trying to see if I can get cause some really nice flashbacks. Uh, Trouble on Planet Earth, which is kind of strange looking. Um, or The Cave of Time. Um, or this very, very, very strange book called You Are a Shark. It's an honest to goodness book. You can still, you can still get it. So here's the question. I do not know if this is a good idea or not, but I give a lot of talks. Um, everywhere. And I'm always, at, at this point, I'm now interested in sort of seeing where we can push a talk. What can we do? So what I would like to do is if the people in this room are amenable, I would very much like to do our own choose your adventure talk. <laughs> so this is a talk where I am going to ask the people in the room to choose what we talk about next from the choices that are here. Um, now, let's say a few things. My talk, my rules. So this is going to be a little bit like Calvin Ball. So uh, you never know what I'm going to do when I change things up, but I am going to be asking for it, uh, asking for people to assist me. Now, one of the things you may or may not notice is that some people in the, in the room have, oh, you know, I feel like I should put this on just ever so briefly. <laughs> this is the only time you're ever going to get a chance to see me in a pith ha helmet. Thank you, Lee, for taking a picture. You feel free to tweet this now quickly while you have, you have the chance, because this is going to be your last chance to ever see me, I hope, in a pith helmet. Uh, but you never know uh, as this goes. Um, so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask somebody who has a, one of these helmets to make the next choice. And then the rule is, is you have to pass the helmet to somebody else. OK? Um, I'm going to be changing the rules when I feel like it. It's going to be totally capricious. It's going to be whatever I feel like it. But this is, and the other thing I want to say is that because we're going to do it in this format here, it makes it awfully hard to rehearse. Um, so I just want to let you know that this particular talk could crash and burn um, in a big way. But I'm hoping that you're willing to sort of like help me sort of like stretch the boundaries of, of the talks you go to just a little bit. And you know, worst comes to this, we're going to have some fun. OK, so what I'm here to talk about Everybody got, their, got their, their moments of fame there? Yes, there we go. OK. What I want to do is, is when we talk about this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do what they do in the, in, the, in the Choose Your Own Adventure books in that I'm going to sort of bookend what we're going to talk about at the beginning, and then I'm going to, then I'm going to, talk, then I'm going to take over and take, and, and take us out on the end. OK? And it's the middle part that I need your help choosing where we're going to go on this. OK? Um, so with that, what I want to do is I want to start this story. This story is fundamentally about a machine um, that was in place as one of the central servers of a previous employer's. And I'd like to thank very much for that previous employer. Some of the people from that employer are here in the audience. Um, feel free to tell me when I get this wrong. Um, but it was in place uh, when I got there back in, I don't know when. I was, I was at this former employer for about 19 years. It was there doing its thing when I, when I got there. And so, uh, and it's, it's still there, though, thank goodness, the people that I left behind were smart enough to start to, to sunset this puppy. But it still exists. So the name of this machine, um, I'm, I'm going to change the name, change the name so like, you know, we're being slightly more secure, is uh, I'm going to call it Tigger. And for those of you who live under a rock, this one's Tigger. <laughs> okay? And what you might hear me to do, because it's a little easier for me, is you might hear me abbreviated as Tig. Okay? So I'll probably talk about Tig a lot instead of Tigger, if that's okay with you. 
Okay, and you know, I've, I've modified you know various pieces of information in this talk to you know just sort of make sure when I say TIG, that's what I'm talking about. So you know that I'm talking about this, this machine called Tigger because you know I'm a big Winnie the Pooh fan. You can imagine that we named our machines after uh, after Winnie the Pooh characters, or maybe that's all false. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> Okay, so the first question I want to talk about is, is the machine that we're talking about, TIG, the same machine that uh, when I got there? There is this notion that, I, and I've heard it in very different ways, like if you take a Viking ship and you replace, and, and over time something breaks and you replace one of the boards in it, um, and then something else breaks or you're just doing upkeep and you replace another board, and then over time, by the time you're done, you've replaced every single one of the pieces of wood that make up that ship, is it still the same ship? Um, I kind of believe it is, and so what I want to do is I want to show you this is the current income. This is an honest English picture taken several months ago. Uh, people in this room can who know what I'm talking about uh, taken uh, of the machine. Okay, so I'm, I'm not, well, this is not abstract. This is not as good as machine. This is what it looks like now in Iraq. Okay, so. Let's talk a little bit about a history of this sort of thing. Now, one of the things that was particularly cool, I, I, my predecessor was super, super smart. He continues to be super, super smart. One of the things that he did is he created a database of machines. From that database, we used to do things like generate DNS and other stuff like that. Okay, so what I can do now, thanks to this database, which is a flat file that gets checked into RCS, so, we're, so there's going to be a little bit of nostalgia in this particular in this particular talk. Please to enjoy it. Um, what I could do is I could go back and look at the old RCS revisions to figure out what was the deal with this particular machine. The farthest I can go back is to to uh, February 18th, 1995. Here is the. Um, here is the record for that. I, I've, I've taken some of, the, some of the things out. I've changed things slightly for that from the very first revision of this database. I suspect the machine might have existed before then, but I don't have any records, so we're going to go with that as, as the canonical thing. Now, there are a few things you might notice in this. This is, uh, this is a uh, Spark uh, 10 uh, Model 30. It's running SunOS 413. Um, it is running, uh, it has a CPU uh, of Spark. It has memory. That's 32 what, please? Megabytes. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So I, one thing I want to see if I can if I can pull out of my bag, just to see if uh, just for uh, just to just so we're like getting the sense of this, um, this thing here, which I bet you can't even see when I hold it up, this thing here is 128 gig. This is more memory than I had in my machine room in total when this was the case. Okay, so so and this cost me thirty dollars. Uh, you're right. I probably did. It's probably much cheaper now. But that's the craziness that we live in right now, right? Is this is this is the state of state of thing? Oh, the other thing that I want to say is when I talk about some stuff here, it's a little hard to tell like who made what decisions when. So I want you to make the assumptions that every bad decision you hear me talk about when it comes to this machine is my fault, and every good thing that we did was either my predecessor or the awesome team of people that worked for me. Okay, so let's just start with that assumption. It'll make, it'll make things easier. Okay, so that means that this thing probably looked a little bit like this. Um, I don't have an actual picture of it. I, did, I didn't try to do that. There wasn't Facebook for machines then. Um, so it looked lo roughly like this. It was a pizza box. So some of us, let's just for fun, how many people in this room touched a spark station like this? Oh, God, I love you. This is good. This is going to be like a, a walk down. This is going to be like a nostalgic walk down the, down the path. And that's what we're doing. We're doing a little bit of, because we're going backwards in time. Okay, so I just wanted to point that out that that's 32 meg, right? It's just kind of really important. And for fun, if you wanted to, it's, if you wanted to guess like how much it cost to buy this, um, I tried to look. Somebody here was selling one back in 1998, and they were willing to ship it to you with the original boxes. This is used for 13K. Now, granted, this thing had a little bit more memory than the one that I'm talking about here at 64 meg, so maybe that's the big difference here, but I just want you to get a sense of that, right? Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, you're right, more. So maybe that's it. Maybe that's the magic. Is, is, is there more there? Um, and the reason what I want to point out to you about this 13K number is yesterday I went on Amazon. This is the Raspberry Pi. You can buy it for, uh, for just $36. It has not a, a 30 megahertz processor. It has a 1.2 gigahertz quad in it. 
you know, and you can go buy it. I'm going to come back to this slide later because I'm going to try to like hammer onto you like this is what the world was that we lived in. Okay, so now it's time to do the first choice. I need somebody who has a hat to tell me which of these things we're going to do. Next. Yes, you, sir. I'm glad you asked. Thank you very much. Um, here it is. Let's play it. Yes. Me again. Now, for people named Josh Simon in the room, I'm only playing less than 30 seconds, so fair use is all in play. So this is, for, I don't think anybody would know this. I have no idea who these people were. This was TLC, okay, and this was the song Creep. And Creep was about, if I, if I get it right, I just want to let you know that I did my research. Creep was about somebody whose boyfriend cheated on them, so they cheated on the boyfriend to get back at them. And one of the people from TLC didn't want to release this as a single because they thought that wasn't a nice thing to do. There's all this drama about this. I recommend you go back because it's really, really important and interesting. <laughs> okay, great. So now we go to the next revision of this particular host. So then in 1995, apparently we upgraded it to the Spark Station 20. Okay, now people who are watching along, what else has changed about this machine that's exciting and new? More memory, that's right, and that's exactly right. We went to 414, which I recall being actually good. I, rec I, like, I don't know why I remember that, but I remember 414. The it was the last one. <laughs> so that's really good, too. Yeah, so it, right, so, so Trey said it was the last one. Um, so yeah, so we upgraded it, and so it probably looks something like this. This is, again, just a dramatic re recreation by hired some actors to play the Spark Station 20, but roughly it looked like this. It was the last pizza box that they ever made. Okay, in this, in, this, in this shape, okay? So um, that's what I want to point out. Now, this thing ran, as best I can tell, roughly around, to, it ran faster than the previous one, which is 36 megahertz, right? It's hard to tell what this one ran because now they put in a faster bus um, and you had two slots and our information doesn't record what exact CPUs we had in it. Sorry. I think it's okay that we've lost this information to the mists of time. I'm probably fine with that, but I just want, I just want to point that out. Now, um, if you want to have fun, I will leave this up. Feel free to take a picture of these. If you want to have fun, these are two links in which somebody attempted to, to um, benchmark um, their Raspberry Pi against their Spark Station 20. And there's and these some, discussion, some discussions about, well, but the 20 was so cool in this way, and what about the Pi? You have the Pi, you have to buy a monitor, you know, and all this other stuff like that. So everybody got these two things. I, you know, I can make these slides available later as well. But these are fun discussions if you're like the kind of geek I am. I didn't want to like summarize those discussions because they're just crazy, but um, okay. You can't get thick net on a Raspberry Pi. Yeah, see, that's... Oh yeah, so I, I just wish to state that I too learned how to do a vampire tap. I am, a, I am one of you. I remember these sort of things where you had to drill into the cable. That was just fun, right, back in the day. So I, I knew there'd be some nostalgia here. Okay, I need someone else who with a hat, and by the way, you have to pass your hat on if you've used it, please, um, who is willing to take the next question. Okay, you've got a hat, we'll go, we'll go with that. Okay, now here's the choice. <laughs> Um, I beg and plead with you to choose the right answer. You know what the right answer is. You know what you want. Do it. Yes, please. So, in case you're curious, the the uh, yeah, don't hurt people with their hats, please. In case you're curious, the first number one song this week on the top of the Billboard charts was another TLC song called Waterfall. And you know the funny thing is, the sad thing is, as I was listening to all this TLC, I was like. Hey, they weren't that bad. Um, but in September, on my birthday in that year, was this. Wait. As I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I take a look at my life and realize there's nothing left. Cause I've been blasting and laughing so long that even my mama thinks that my mind is gone. But I ain't never crossed a man that didn't deserve it. Again, 29 seconds. <laughs> Just pointing it out. 
Um, this is what, please? Gangster's, Gangster's Paradise. Right, by? Yes, thank you very much. I just want to make sure you're an educated audience. So that was by far, I think, what it should have been. But unfortunately, it was TLC when we got this. I don't think you can plan when you get the machines based on the billboard charts as much as I really think you should. Um, OK, so that one was, was there. So let's move forward. So we had this habit, whether this is better or whether this is good or not, of we would get a new machine in. We call it Pig New. Right or whatever it is, dash new. Um, it, we would, you know, load it up, and eventually we would do the DNS swap, and we change its name. Right. So now let's see where we've gone. We've gone from the pizza boxes, right? These these big pizza boxes into things that look like this, and our pains in the butt to try to mount. That's all I got to say. That as the people here know, having ha having some of the people here who had to take them out. Okay. So um, this tick this tick new thing. Um, so big changes here. Big changes. Uh, what are the things you notice? Right, we got Solaris for better or worse. Yes, right, right. <laughs> right. For those, are, I'm sure that Oracle has done a great job with it. If you're running it, I, I, you know, I just, I don't, you know, I don't, you know, like, I don't want to, I don't want to demean them. It's great. Um, and we got a whopping 256 megs of memory. Yes, awesome sauce. Right. OK, and for some reason, we recorded display of 8, which I think meant the CG8 frame buffer, if I remember correctly. So it's hard for me to tell just how fast this puppy was, because again, they sold it in different models with the UltraSpark. And we didn't record that information, because at that time, we didn't really feel we needed that sort of stuff. And maybe we need that. OK, and just so we know, kind of like for context, um, if you were born on a day, this was your biorhythm. Um, <laughs> Uh, just in case you're curious, does anybody here in this room remember biorhythms, right? It was like, yeah, right. So, the, and how many people in this room actually like used a program or wrote a program or did something or plotted their own biorhythm just because that's what we were doing, right? It was like, it was like the version of horoscopes, right? <laughs> Except, you know, so pseudoscientific, you know, anyway. Okay, so that's enough of that. Um, okay, so because we're, I guess, crazy, um, at some point in time, we sunsetted that machine, and we called it that machine dash bye bye. I don't remember doing this. I really don't remember doing this. I'm sure I did this, but I don't remember doing this. But this is where it went, um, and there it is. So I want to point out something that's kind of interesting in the delta in times. Um, we're now at 2000. This was, remember, it was TIG dash new back in 1998. Now it's out of there in 2000, and we've started. We're starting to move the amount of time and the, the speed at which we're replacing machines is starting to collapse. Okay, and in case you wanted to go buy one, um, here's the thing I don't really get. It really blew my mind when I went to look for this that on CNET there was there was this thing because I was like, okay, CNET Sun Enterprise, Sun Enterprise 450, and there's a holiday shopping guide. Wouldn't your spouse think, <laughs> think that you were the kindest, most gentle person if this is what you left under the tree, providing you could have room uh, <laughs> to roll it under the tree? Yeah, so right. Well, so, so yeah, so they're saying, so what, I, what, what the person in front of me is saying is that, like, you know, you can get stuff, you can get stuff a little cheaper. And again, let me show you this picture here of the Raspberry Pi for, for that. And I just want to say that's the MSRP. I'm certain that you can get it for cheaper if you simply said to Sun, um, we'll buy one. <laughs> <laughs> is my recollection. Um, but anyway, okay. So now I'm going to show you two records from this database. Put together, and in case you're curious, one of the things I should have mentioned in parentheses is the RCS revision number at which point this change happened, right? Just in case you're curious. And if you were watching long, you might notice that we are now up from 1.1 to like 2,000. You know, this gives you a sense of also a sense of churn in our, in our environment. So this is what happens again where we take in a new machine, and this new machine um, was a two, was a 280R. Okay, it was running Solaris. It has a memory 2048. Now, what does that mean, folks? What are we up to? Two gig. That's right. We've reached gig, right? So this is awesome. It's running Solaris 8, which is better than 2.6, right? Because it's a lot of numbers more. Um, um, and so the other thing that I want to also note that's interesting to me, and I cannot tell you why, is that you might notice that that, that habit we had where we take a machine in and we call it new to the point where we promoted it to be the thing. 
there is a fairly significant gap here where we got it in in September and then we only really put it into, into play in, into, in May. And the question that you might ask yourself is why, and I don't know. I can't truly remember why that was the case. It could be, you know, things or life or whatever. Um, but it's also interesting to me the amount of time it takes and, could, and took us at some point in time to roll new, to know, to roll new infrastructure into place and to have uh, key things come into being what they are. And this, this record here, that's this picture here. This machine still exists. That's when we put it in. Here, I'll go back to this time. It, it became the real thing in 2003. It is now 2016. It is still there. It is still humming away. It is still doing things. And that's what this talk is about. Are we ready to have the talk? Good, let's talk. Okay, time to choose. Um, I need someone to choose. In fact, I'm not going to show you what these things are until I, until I get somebody who's willing to, to be on the hook for choosing. You, sir. Ready? Now, one of these could be stand up and sing my way in a funny voice. I'm just warning you. So you're, you're, still, you're okay for that? <laughs> Great. Okay, here's your choices. We can either talk about what did that machine do, or we can talk about the crown jewels. Which would you like to, to do? Well... Darn. <laughs> I'm happy to talk about it, though. Like, I, I, I'm, in, I'm all in. OK. Did you know you could do hyperlinks and hypertext in PowerPoint? Bet you didn't, because you didn't want to think it was a good idea. And you're right. <laughs> Just letting you know. OK. So here's the question. What do we actually keep on this machine? What, and we'll go back to what it does later if we, in fact, come back to that room in this talk. Um, we used to keep like all the information about users. They're in something we called user base. What a, what a creative thing, but it's true. Um, you know, all the information, their, their, their UID, their uh, GID, you know, all this other good stuff like that, GCOS and stuff like that. Um, we used to keep um, it, the, we also keep the information because it was the NIS master. So these are all the maps that we used to put out. How many in this room know what NIS is? Okay, how many in this room don't know what NIS is? Okay, so, it's like, so there are a couple of people here. I think that's because you're youngins. And so if you're going to be like, don't give me any of that stuff, Grandpa, I'm going to be like, time will come for you too someday. <laughs> that's what I want to say. You know, like, like if, you know, you should go back and read uh, the Piers Anthony books, you know, On a Pale Horse and et cetera on, right? Uh, time will come for you. Anyway, NAS was a directory system that allowed you to basically have um, the configuration of various machines live on a central machine that would then essentially get queried. I'm, I'm, I'm aligning a lot of stuff because everybody, people who know what NIS says, um, will, will, you know, could be, could be um, propagated out to other machines so you wouldn't have to keep the same config files on every single machine. That's just a simple version. Um, NIS stood for Network Information Services, remember? Right? It was the successor to YP after British Telecom went after uh, Sun with lawyers. <laughs> And boy, this is a big change. So all of a sudden, yesterday before, when the command was YPCAT, the awesomeness of Solaris, whatever, was now it was NISCAT. Yay us. Um, it, we, this is where we keep sort of secret information, like the certs for various machines, um, a bunch of privileged information. Later in this talk, if we actually get to this room, we used to keep things like compl user complaints and other stuff like that on this machine. Um, and this machine was trusted by all the other machines. Right? And that's a really crucial piece of information that we used to use this as an administrative host. You could, from this machine, operate with administrative access on many things, including, say, our, our network storage. OK. Next hat, please. We're going to go back there. Yes, sir. Garrett, you're on. I want you to talk about either the family jewels or the family jewels. <laughs> no, 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 don't speak yet. I want you to think this over a little bit. Don't be hasty. Now, I just want to point out, being the person in control of this talk, sometimes I'm going to force you into a choice. That's what they did in the books. It's OK to do it now. So it's OK. So pick the, pick the one. OK, how about the right-hand side family choice? Excellent choice. Now, the tricky thing about the stuff that I just said is the family jewels, these are the things that I consider to be sort of kind of vulnerabilities. Because on this machine, we had user information, NAS master, certs, privileged information. It's trusted by all machines. 
So here's the thing. So, so this is a key point here. The, the plus of keeping all this stuff in one place was um, it was there. It was, this was the machine we had to defend. The minus was if you get kicked in, the, uh, in that machine in some particular way, um, then you were severely screwed. <laughs> So we would put a lot of effort into making sure that this was like one of the most secure machines that we had. You know, the most locked down, the mo you know, it had the things uh, that would check for root kits, it had other stuff like that. And the thing that was also interesting that, that I want to point out that will be useful for us to talk about later is the other thing about this machine is that nothing depended on this machine being up for the environment to run. To make changes to the environment, sure, but for it to run, didn't have to. So that meant that we could, for example, upgrade it to the latest version of whatever, or patch, you know, Solaris blah blah blah, or remember package add and stuff like that, to do, to do all these things to this machine without taking down, without the rest of the world going bye bye. It's either good or bad, but it's it's a thing. Next hat, please. Jessica, ready? Yes. The day we lost roots. Or starting McStart scripts. <laughs> Great. Okay, let me tell you this story. It's story time. Okay, I'm going to tell you this story. Um, this happened quite a while back ago, and I want to make sure. Okay, oh, we're good. We're doing good at great on time. Um, so this happened a long time ago. Um, uh, I have told this in other, in other public settings, I think it's okay to say, this was the day where we managed to, on all of our machines, by mistake, zorch one of the files that was key for giving us, essentially, sudo and administrative access on machines. I think it was Etsy Shadow, I don't remember, per se, but we managed to zorch it. And at some point in time, um, I, I have this recollection that either I did it, or one of my, one of my, one of my staff did it, or something like that, where we would, we would do it, and then uh, somebody came to me and said, you know, I think we have a problem. Um, and I said, oh, really? Uh, yes, I think that I have just unfortunately broken our ability to get root on all of our machines and to do anything uh, on our machines from an administrative point of view. So I, I took that in for a moment. Um, and then I said to myself, well, self, because I mean, what else are you going to say? Um, how long exactly before people notice <laughs> that my group can't actually do anything. Is it a day? Is it two days? Is it a week? Yes, I know you want to make that a user account. We'll have that for you in a few days. You know, like I'm, I'm, like, I'm like already planning this out. Like the question really is how long before people could tell, you know, that we couldn't do anything. Um, so, um, Anyway, we thought about it a little bit more than that because once you get over that, once you've had that thought, that little pep talk with yourself, you have to figure out what to do. So what we want, what we wound up doing, what I wound up doing is I was like, okay, well, I don't have root, and neither does any of my staff. Who does? And I thought, well, there's stuff that runs on every machine every night as root, right? So let's go take a look at what that stuff is, and I can actually pull up the actual file to show you. One of the things that was uh, that ran on every single machine at night was a cron job that attempted to determine whether disks were full. Do you remember when disks could fill up um, back in the day? So it would attempt to tell what disks would do. And what it did is it ran the GNU version of DEF or DU, I can't remember which one it was at the time. Um, okay, so it ran that command. Now. The GNU version of things weren't built by, uh, until later on, by Sun and slash Oracle slash whatever. They were built by humans like us. I had built that version of DU that, get, that got called in that cron job. I had I configured, I'd run configure and make and stuff like that, and I had built it. When I went to look, that file out on our file system was still owned by me. <laughs> so what I did is I replaced that file with another program that would fix the problem on every machine so we could get it back. And because I'm awesome, it ran to you. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, like, it should do its job. So what happened in that particular case is I went to bed a little nervous. About 3 a.m. in the morning, every machine with minus plus or minus the thundering herd, we used to we used to stagger our cron jobs. Would wake up and fix themselves. And in the morning, we came in and look, we still had a job. <laughs> so 
It's a good story. And I, you know, it was just fun to see the actual command in the startup scripts that were about that. Okay, I need the next person who's going to do it. Yes, sir, all the way back there in the orange, please. You know, you're, you're holding, you with the hat up. Yep, ready? Okay, here we go. The day we lost root, we could say, do it again. So there's a, there's a bug in this talk, obviously. Or starting mix start scripts. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, so there are a few things I want to note that we did in our startup scripts that I think were kind of cool, and I really appreciated it when I went back and looked at it. One of the things that we did is um, we ran a command every time that the machine would come up called the name of the employer or the department or whatever. I'm not going to tell you what it is because I'm just aligning that a little bit. You can all figure it out, I'm sure. Um, if I itself. And what would happen is, is that programs, which was a homebrew thing, would come up and attempt to take a machine from bare metal, essentially, to useful to us. So this was sort of like before the days of config management were really there, it would come up and would it make the machine, uh, it make the machine look like it's supposed to. And every time it would come up, it would decide, do I have to make this machine the way it's supposed to or not? And I thought that was kind of cool back then that, that like, you know, you'd boot the machine and it would bring itself to useful. Right? And that was not necessarily assumed. When you get it out of the box and you turned it on, it didn't start being useful to us. Right? And there was this process to do that. The other thing is, is that it also, um, after we started having, after we had that problem with um, Etsy Shadow, I, looked, I was looking at the startup scripts, so I was like, what does the program Watch Me do? And then someone was kind enough to show me what it did, and it just copied the shadow file that was backed up, if it was necessary, into place. So we started writing things on boot that would fix the machine if there were problems. You know, and as we learned, we would do this. Now, I'm not saying that this was smart uh, to do this, but, I, but it was interesting to me that we had started doing some self-healing sort of stuff. Um, self-healing from stupidity and stupid self-healing, I give you all that, but we had started doing that, and I think that's kind of cool. Okay, I need the next person. We're gonna go over to this side. Yes, you're up, ready? Okay, uh, uh, my way, do you, know the, do you know all the words? Okay, bummer, then we're gonna do this. <laughs> okay, that's some strange terrain, or this is boring, but has a pretty picture. Excellent. A good choice, sir. You're going to like the wine. Um, so one of the things that was interesting to me as I went and looked at the, sort of the, looked over this machine was we had some things on this machine that were very specific to our environment, for better or worse. The first thing that wasn't specific to our environment was something called opt CSW. Anybody here in this room remember CSW? Right? What was CSW for the people who, who, who remember it? Somebody, just raise your hand and I'll call you. Go ahead, Bessie. Yeah, so let me, so let me, re, so let me, re, let, me um, let me rephrase that slightly. So what CSW was, was I think it was a community Solaris, I can't remember what it stands for, and actually OpenCSW still exists. Um, but the idea was, and this is crazy, I know, like hold on to your seats here, somebody else would build the common packages you need and make it available so you could install it on your machine so you wouldn't have to build them yourself, right? This was like amazing. This was like manna from heaven. This was like, are you kidding me? Like, like I don't have to figure out how to build tech now, you know, like, or Emacs or X11 and stuff like that. Crazy, man, totally crazy. And so this was a game changer. This was like so awesome. But the problem was, as was pointed out, is once you started getting into that world, congratulations, you were in that world and you had to hope everything was, was cool with the things that were built. Now this may sound vaguely familiar, maybe someday you'll encounter this problem, um, but, this, cra but the, this was back in the day, this reminded, this was back in the day where you wanted a piece of software and you wanted to make it available to your users, you built it and put it in place so they could find it. And this was a change to that. And that yeah, and so what, what was being said is, is that building some of the GNU tools under Solaris was a bit of work. And also some of the larger systems, right? You know, like Emacs. I mean, I still remember, like, Emacs, okay, had a dump stage. Like, it was all awesome, right? I can remember all these things. Um, so the other thing that's also interesting is that we used to have a convention where we would keep stuff that was, that was local to the machine in something called slash priv. Um, and there's a bunch of stuff in slash priv for us. There was stuff, there was administrative tools, there was data that was local to the machine on, on this host that we're talking about here. It had some sensitive information in it. But the thing is, is that we started inventing, because they didn't exist yet, conventions for our own site. Now, if I were to think about doing this now, which we'll talk about later, I'm not clear I would go this direction. 
Um, and similarly, this is where we would build stuff, like if you wanted to make a piece of software available to everything of that architecture, we would stick it in slash arch. So, but people now wouldn't know from this, right? They, they wouldn't know from the, these sort of things. Um, and the other thing I'm just going to say is a side note that was kind of fun is we used to have essentially our own uh, equivalent of MOTD that was that was across hosts and it was something called a um, lawyer names news. The thing that was interesting about this is what it would do is it would see whether there were any you know a message of the day from us our staff and stuff like that and then it would display it to the user and then it would record that it had done so. What was interesting about this is it would record that it had done so per machine. So there were everybody had a dot blah news directory. So one of the things that was super useful to us was if in fact, and this never happened, but this, this in fact somebody got into somebody else's account or there was some sort of hacking, we had this really interesting way to have some sense of how far they got into our systems because we just look in this directory and see where did they log in. It's not the best way to do it, but it was interesting because it was obscure enough, nobody expected it, they got into, you know, that we knew that they probably weren't going to look for it and mess with it. So just a random thing. Okay, I need to go back that away. Yes, sir. Ready? The directory of evil or the directory of evil? You know, I feel like, you know, I, and I feel like I'm going to probably also make, let me, let me before you choose, because uh, this direction is going to get us out of, this, out of this talk, and we have another seven minutes. I'm going to go back and tell you what this actual machine did. Is that okay? Is it okay if I fix, fix the story? Because I feel like, like I was expecting us to go that direction, and I, I know that. But I'm going to fix the story just a little bit and go back up to what it did. Just because I feel like that's probably a useful, a useful thing for you to know. Okay? So... And next time I give this talk, if ever, um, I'll change it. So like I said before, it was our administrative host. It was the thing that had root on everything, including our, our file systems. It held a lot of the source of truth for us. It's where we had the truth about the users. It's where we had the truth about the files and stuff like that. Um, it was a time host. Right? Not only the only time host, because we're, we're not that, you know, we're, we're, we're smart. We, we only have two clocks in, in, in the place. Uh, no, that was a joke. Um, the two clock problem? Anyway, um, we, it would do a bunch of the privileged processing. So it would run a bunch of the cron jobs that would remake man pages or, or generate lists of machines or that sort of stuff like that. And it did, it did a bunch of stuff through cron jobs. And one of its big purposes in life is it held the eggs, right? It, this was where we put our, all our eggs in this basket. Right? That's where it was. So we had to make sure that this host was super secure. And one of my former staff um, sent me this. Um, not now, honey. I'm on the, I'm on the talk. Um, um, one of the things that, uh, that was kind of cool is last night, one of my former staff sent me this card. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he's in the room, <laughs> and I thank you very much. Um, so anyway, this is the harbinger of technical debt, because right now they feel very strongly that anything that is still on this machine is a sign of bad and is a sign of technical debt, and, and I get that as well. And I thought this was super clever. Okay, so now let's go back to your decision. Okay, I would really like it if people would stop calling me right now. I'm going to turn that off right now. Oh, you know what we didn't also do? I'm going to do one more thing. Can we do, would someone be okay if we saw the pretty picture? Because I worked damn hard on the pretty picture. <laughs> I would really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Okay, so I, I did. I really did work hard on this picture. So here is the pretty picture. Here's one of the pretty pictures. So one of the things that I had wanted to do is I wanted to do some analysis on the file systems to see if I can, I know it's barely readable. I'll tell you what it is in a sec. I wanted to do an analysis on the file systems to see whether I could learn something by creation dates of the files. When did something happen? And so I spent a long, long, long time writing programs since I didn't have access to the machine anymore. I didn't have access to, to a dump of like ls-l of incorporating the ls-l into a SQL database and running all these queries against it. And I spent hours upon hours and days upon days trying to find useful, useful information from that sort of stuff. Um, and uh, that pretty picture comes from this particular, this particular SQL query, in case you're curious. Um, and this is coming out of Google Charts. So I got a chance to learn, learn Google Charts. And what this attempts to show is when were things created. So the things that, that, that I, what I want to say that I want to point out about this particular picture um, is two things. Um, over here, since I'm not, since it's not gonna, whoop, come back here, come back here. There you are. 
So over here, uh, there's a few things I want to point out. Over here, this starts out in 1973. We're going to talk about that in a second. And this is roughly about 40,000 files um, happened in that month. This is per month, per year. Okay. So one of the things that I kind of so here's the here's the deal with this. Um, let me answer some questions. Let me answer the questions you have about that picture. Okay, that's good. Um, first off, um, the oldest file on the machine was uh, from 1973. It is it is a way big anomaly. I cannot explain it. I do not know why that file is dated 1973, 05, 04. That's not even the epoch. I don't even know. I can't even tell you. If you have a guess, you can tell me later. Okay, I have no idea. So because the next question is, what are the next two? And the next two are 1992 and 1993. One of them is, an old, is a backup from something else, and the other one is two files from the account system that I'm not going to show you. Okay? Um, the 40,000 one that is up there um, is what happens when we actually put CSW on, into place, and congratulations, it, they decided they were going to build stuff from X11. So that's when, like, boom, here, have some files. Okay? Um, and here's the deal. Um, is there more analysis that has to be done? Yes, and I would really appreciate it if you would talk to me in the future, um, because that's when I, when I will have done it. Um, I sort of exhausted most of the naive versions uh, of what I could do when I was doing this analysis. I came to the conclusion later that um, uh, you can't do just naive analysis. You have to do something that is semantically aware that can say, oh, this is what this directory means. This is, these are the things that go together. To get really useful information, you have to do it. But I really spent a lot of time exhausting all the naive solutions to see what I could get out of this. Okay, so now we're gonna go. Okay, I'm watching my time. Now we're gonna zip ahead, he says, once he can get his cursor back. Okay, so we're gonna go to the directory evil. And then we're going to talk about my end things, and then I'm going to be out of here. Um, the next speaker, can you raise your hand in this room? Can you give me two minutes? Can I, is that cool with you? I really appreciate it. Okay. You're going to like it. You're going to be super happy. I'm going to wind them up for you. You're going to be really good. Okay. So there is a directory called something something, I'm not going to tell you what it is, user problems, in which we would put in essentially incident reports of problems with our users. It is still on those machines. It's really fun to go back and look at them to decide what over time, over like 20 some odd years, 25 odd years, did we have problems with? And if I had to say one thing, it would be this. <laughs> I know that people used IRC and lots of really good human communication went over it, but oh boy was this a pain in our buttocks. I just can't begin to tell you the number of things where like, somebody called me a poopy head on IRC and you have to do something about it. <laughs> you know, like it just went on and on. We would get mail that looks like this. And I am, this is the exact formatting. Right? And we'd be like, what the hell? Like, you know, like, like go away. Like, I am not going to do this for our users. But we would get stuff like this all the time. Okay? The other thing that also we'd find in there was people misusing the system. Like the time where we had, I believe it was a grad student who had filling up one of our disks with porn. Just to be clear about it, that's exactly what it was. The afterwards, when we let them know about it, we got this awesome mail. I'm not going to read all of it, but it said, uh, this, firstly, I'd like to bring you to attention this home address. You know, you shouldn't do this without express consent. Secondly, I'm going to say a bad word. They, and this is mail they sent to us. Secondly, I would like to tell you all to fuck off and die um, <laughs> for accessing my account um, and telling a professor that sort of stuff. Then they would say, well, if disk space is so limited, why didn't you get a bigger hard drive back then? In fact, um, what I'm willing to do is I'm willing to give you a 40 meg hard drive, 40 meg hard drive if you would give me 10 megabit, but given all the money that we put into this sort of this place, um, can't you afford the 900 to 1100 dollars for a gig hard drive? Just pay attention to that part. Um, and a scully's control, and the one or two hours it would take to set up the disk map. <laughs> right? Anyway, thank you very much. No, 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 I'm not done. Sorry, that's that's I'm just I'm I'm quoting for this. I'm not done. I'm almost done. I promise I'm done. Um, okay, and then we'd also get mail like this where someone would spoof mail, and this is what made my heart sing. Well, this was the day when people would spoof mail to harass other people by sending them a UU encoded file. It made me so happy. Like, I don't really know why you would do that, but that's what made my heart sing. Okay, so what I want to do is just talk a little bit about what I got out of this and what I think we can take future, and then I'm done. Okay, so it turns out that we did do some cool stuff in these 20 years, like around configuration management, stuff like that. Um, this, I think I would change. It was a very insecure way to run things, to have this all the stuff in one, in one place. 
Um, uh, and I would probably shatter that. One of the things that I've learned as part of this thing is that file systems tell, you, we think that file systems can't tell you why. Like when I did my analysis, they can't tell you why all of a sudden this happened. They can tell you barely what and when, but they can't tell you why you have all these files right there for that sort of stuff. And we're, st we're still not there. Um, um, I think I learned also that it takes a community to build a machine um, and to make it useful. And the other thing that I learned is that the public hasn't really changed in 20 years. And the users populations haven't. So if you're going to be building stuff nowadays, um, just be ready for that. And with that, I want to thank you all for your, your attention. This was awesome. And thank you very much.